Hey, it's John Hucker, uh, founder of Fintech Plus, and I'm here again this week with a great guest, Dan Toma, who's one of the co-authors of a, a book I've really enjoyed in the last couple of years called The Corporate Startup. Um, with everybody taking time at home over the holidays, I thought it would be a perfect time to take a look at a book that's uh, a little bit of a read, but for those of you who are in the uh, increasingly important space of startup and corporate interactions, uh, whether it's as an entrepreneur trying to work with corporates or uh, a corporate insider trying to figure out how you can keep pace with agile startups. Um, Dan's somebody who I think really brings a lot. Uh, I was really pleased to see that we share a lot in common, including uh, both being born in Canada and the Toronto area. Uh, we're also both MBAs and hope to prove to you today that MBAs can bring some value uh, and also bring a lot of experience in the topic of ecosystem building, which is close to my heart. So uh, without further ado, I wanted to welcome today's guest, Dan Toma. Thank you very much for having me on the show. So uh, as I was uh, throwing into my introduction there, um, you're one of the co-authors of a book that came out, I think it was two years ago, The Corporate Startup. Um, do you want to just yeah. introduce everybody to what, what the book's all about and what you do with your work? Sure, sure, sure. Uh, so, so the book is essentially a, um, let, let's say, a working book. Uh, for the people that are um, essentially struggling with corporate innovation, that are struggling with uh, making innovation happen in their large organizations. Uh, it's essentially a book that uh, you go to whenever you have a question, uh, try to figure out how you run one experiment within your company or how you set up an innovation strategy for, for your large organization in order to become more, more innovative. Um, I think the book came to be um as as i mentioned earlier in our conversation john um essentially was uh was my 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 diary if you want uh, of uh, trying to change a large organization not just my diary but uh everybody that's listed on the cover so all three co-authors we had different uh degrees of experience in trying to change large organizations in different sectors in telecommunication in banking in publishing uh different countries However, the problems were, were the same. To use a very trendy word nowadays, it was a pandemic of issues uh, that large organizations suffer from, and we decided to, to write this book. Um, we, try to, we try to be very humble in the book uh, because we believe that every organization is different, at least culture-wise, so everybody should find their own recipe on how to change their specific organization. So take it as a reference book, not necessarily applying it dogmatically uh, as, as written there. Great. And I guess, Dan, stepping back a bit from our own personal experience, why do you think uh, the engagement between corporates and startups is becoming more of an important topic? Can you give some background to why this has become you know, a career focus for you, really, and an important topic yeah. of work here? Yeah, so um, there's, um, there's two things we, we, we need to talk about. First of all, um, you know, Organizations are, are uh, now, nowadays, in particular, drawn to the idea of innovation and digital transformation. We should not uh, we should not consider digital transformation as a synonym for innovation, but that's another conversation. Um, however, they are they are drawn to growing by creating new things, and you can do this in two ways. You can either do it internally, and most organizations have tried that. Um, some with uh, with more success than others. And now there is another, um, let's say, avenue you can take, and that's the avenue of collaborating with uh, with startups. A lot of organizations try, large organizations try to collaborate with startups because they find it to be at least on paper easier and um, and cheaper, if you want, than to build their own internal things. However, and again, history is teaching us that uh, those things only work on paper. And uh, sometimes collaborations between startups and, and large organizations tend to fail, and sometimes they fail worse than internal ventures. So um, again, there is no silver bullet. If you want to have a large organization, be it a bank or a pharma company or an automotive company, grow for innovation. There is absolutely no silver bullet. Just uh, just saying we're going to do startup collaborations, it's not necessarily the way forward and not necessarily easier than saying we're going to do it internally. I was going to say, Dan, and I think you're hitting on this. I think for a lot of people who aren't as uh, familiar with this space or open innovation in general, uh, the idea of a corporate and a startup is a bit like oil and uh, water. The two don't, the two don't mix. Um, do you see that as an inherent contradiction, or is there something um, is there something special about the interaction between these two very different worlds 
And, and I guess that leads into really the question of well, what is the secret to making it work? Because because obviously, if there was no science or no rhyme to it, um, yeah, there there wouldn't be much more to talk about here today, right? Right, right, right. Um, to answer the, the beginning of your question, I, I find it very interesting because actually the desire, the ambition, the goal, the dream of every startup entrepreneur is to have their startup become a corporation, <laughs> right? And that's, uh, that's very interesting, right? Nobody, nobody said, I want to create a startup because I only want to have a startup. I want, to have, uh, I, I, I want to start this company of two employees and I would like it to be two, a, a two-employee company for the rest of eternity and um obviously there are there are examples of uh, let's say mom and pop stores they want to they want to stay there they want to stay at that size right if you are for example doing a I don't know, bakeries or whatever right you don't necessarily have a desire to scale but for the startups in the in the tech industry for startups that that use technology as their as the backbone of what what they do they have an inherent need and desire to become a large organization in their own right and um on the other side right large organizations they want to become um more startup-y uh, what do we mean by more startup-y become more agile uh, become uh, again more customer centric. Uh, take decisions faster. Uh, move faster from from one idea to the other. Pivot um, and um, obviously um, integrate customer input into or customer feedback into whatever it is that they are doing. So um, I'm not saying that there's a contradiction between uh, between the two. I don't. I'm not saying that they are like water and oil. Um, obviously, the differences are pretty stark. Uh, and not not just referring to the headcount, but the way they work, culture, and everything. Uh, but they can definitely work together. And there's plenty examples out there of um, of of you know successful collaborations and successful uh, partnerships between startups and large organizations, regardless of industry. Great. Well, I think that makes uh, a lot of sense. Um, I want to get a bit into the the book, Dan, and um, I, I'm familiar with uh, a lot of other concepts around innovation management, and I think some people have been familiar with Clayton Christensen and the idea mm -hmm. of the innovator's dilemma, uh, and I'm familiar with my time being a, a bit of a disruptor inside a corporate environment and learning about antibodies. Um, you talk about the idea of the innovation paradox. Is that something a bit different? Can you, can you explain what you're talking about in Yes, yeah, so the the innovation paradox, I think, was uh, was um, I think it was heavily inspired by by Clayton Christensen and uh, and his work. Um, essentially, it's uh, it's very interesting if you observe large organizations and startups the way they uh, the way they tend to behave around growth through innovation. Um, large organizations, despite their um, financial power, if you want, right, the number of assets that they have at their disposal. The, 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 fewer amount of money that they have in their bank accounts, um, find it very difficult to create something new. However, startups that uh, don't have that particular power, uh, they find it very easy to start creating stuff. And I think that's, uh, that's, that, that's, that's the paradox of, um, of innovation that, that we see. And obviously, from, from this one, we can derive the second one, which is uh, that large organizations find, find it very difficult to run their core business while, innovated on, while innovating, um, or better still, they are not good at running two different operating systems, uh, one focused on discovery, and uh, focused on on growth and focused on moving things from zero to one, and the other system focused on it's called day to day business, right? But it's uh, it's essentially operating something that's at scale. Thanks for clarifying that, Dan. I, I wanted to ask, I guess, um, uh, a related question: What's the point then, or how can innovation ecosystems help to solve that problem? Is is that something that plays a critical role in your eye? Is that the secret sauce to solve this uh, solve this dilemma? Yeah, the more the more organizations. Again, I'm not I'm not a big fan of silver bullets. I'm not saying that that is the only way an, an organization needs to do, and that's the that's a do or die solution. Um, however, I think that um, most organizations need to start thinking ecosystem and start to thinking ownership less. Uh, what do I mean by that? Right, we live in a, in a day and age where 
you don't actually need to own stuff in order to 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 make things. I remember when I was uh, an entrepreneur first time in 2004, 2005. And um, I, I remember us needing to have our own server to host our websites and our e-stores and everything that we were doing. And that required a lot of effort from us. Nowadays, you can rent that thing from, from Amazon very cheaply or from Microsoft or from any other provider. Um, much in the same way, large organizations need to think about the ecosystem that they are playing in. Sometimes you don't need to own necessarily a, a, certain, a certain proposition. You can co-own it with a startup. You can, uh, you can recreate it with, um, with, uh, with other parties in the, in the industry. And I'm going to give you an example here because I think this actually speaks to the audience uh, of, of your yep. channel. Um, in, uh, I, I spend a good amount of time in Norway uh, helping transform a large bank. Uh, the name of the bank, I don't know if, if the listeners uh, know it or not, it's called DMB. It's the largest uh, Scandinavian bank um, based out of awesome. Not a lot of people uh, that I've spoken with uh, knew about DMB, but uh, apparently you know it. Um, so DMB is based out, most based, based out of Oslo. I think in 2016, 2017, uh, there was a big push from a, from a startup in, uh, in Denmark into the Norwegian market um, on a solution, on a, on a mobile payment solution. So essentially going to the store and instead of uh, instead of paying with your credit card, you will either tap your phone or you will be able to send money between users of the same uh, of the same uh, of the same app. Um, again, today in 2020, it's not necessarily new. Uh, you might have heard about the name Vips. This is the name of the, uh, the solution that DMB created as a response to this Danish app. Where is the Vips story interesting? So first of all, Vips was created by DMB internally with their own funds, own development, own everything. And at one point, they realized that by keeping it a DMB solution, they wouldn't get to scale as fast as they wanted and as fast as it will prevent the Danish competitor from making the move into, into Norway. So instead of uh, trying to spend more money and more effort try to scale something that they obviously weren't prepared to scale, uh, they decided to spin out Vips and create a startup out of Vips. And they invited all the other banks in Norway to take a stake in the new startup. So DMB went from a majority stakeholder to, um, I don't want to say a, a minority one, but have uh, they, they went from owning the startup to owning part of it uh, in an equal share with all the other banks in Norway. So again, uh, they decided to play the ecosystem card in order to prevent them from getting disrupted by a startup coming from outside. Maybe maybe to step back a minute, we should distinguish. There's quite a lot of tools. I remember when I came across the idea of open innovation, it was from the, the concept that uh, industries uh, reach a maturity, right? They go through a life cycle mm -hmm. from rising up the S-curve to reach maturity and then declining down into uh, obsolescence. And that instead of investing loads and loads of money in R&D, as companies that had stayed successful in the past had done, um, that now I think there was a recognition that uh, an open mindset to recognize at least as many smart ideas and opportunities outside of the walls of the research lab and the company, um, you know, recognizing that was a, a good thing and, and a big moment in, in the maturity of open innovation as a practice. Um, when, when you describe ecosystem, where does that fit into, let's say, a portfolio of different uh, ideas, like say corporate venture capital or partnering with a startup or some of the other things that are being described now? How do you how do you distinguish the different tools and where open innovation? ecosystem fits into all of that yeah so ecosystem is essentially um an, an array of things that uh that you are either part of or an array of things that you are using in order to to grow um corporate venture capital per se is just a tool that uh that you use and it's it's a form of, of interaction between you and the ecosystem at large. Uh, the ecosystem is just uh, the, the array of things that you have at your disposal, right? It's, it's CVC, it's open innovation, it's all the other things. It's internal innovation, it's, uh, it's collaborations with startups, it's, in, it's internal innovation. So that's the, that's the ecosystem bit. Open innovation, CVC, they're essentially 
just tools. And depending on what is the problem that you're trying to solve for your organization, you can deploy one tool over another. Uh, for example, TVC is great at um, you know, giving you that, uh, that end of the year success. However, CVC is not going to move the needle culture-wise, for example, in your organization. You can go in and invest in all the startups in the world. Uh, this will not change the organizational culture on your end. Um, if you want to do that, if you want to change organizational culture, maybe there are other tools in the in the toolbox, and there are other ecosystem plays you can you can make in order to move the needle on culture. However, those things might not necessarily result in a very fast uh, PNL at the end of the year. It's needless to say, quite a sophisticated place. I mean, a lot of these things are straightforward once you understand them. But there's a lot of options and different players and, and combinations that can really quite mm -hmm. expand into a lot of different options here for a manager. Isn't that right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, yeah. so I guess to maybe summarize, it's hard to, to spell out a specific silver bullet, but, but maybe again to come to the book, what, what are the practices or what are the tools that you think help a manager or somebody who's a corporate disruptor or entrepreneur uh, what are the tools that they can really use to help guide them when they enter this uh, complicated web of, of the open innovation ecosystem? Yeah, one of the primary things that large organizations need to have before they try to make anything innovation-wise is to have a very clear innovation strategy. So without a very clear innovation strategy, it doesn't actually matter if you're going to go and work with, uh, work with startups, invest in them, create an internal venture. They, all these things will most likely fail because of lack of focus um, and lack of, uh, lack of uh, priority, if you want. Um, however, if you start from an innovation strategy, then you're going to get that, that much needed clarity, that much needed and much desired, um, yeah, essentially, essentially clarity on the things that you want to do, like options of things you want to do, um, you know, direction in, in which you want to when you, in which you want to move. Uh, the thing is that um, without that strategy, then everything will be random. And again, the strategy, I think it's, uh, it's the fundamental piece that it's, that it's required um, yeah, all throughout. No matter if you want to work with a startup, you need to have a very clear strategy. What are the startups we want to work with? If we want to build stuff internally, Cool. We need to go and refer to the strategy and see what are the startups we want to we want to build internally. Um, if we want to open uh, work in open innovation with the university, what are the topics that we would like to engage with that particular entity on? So again, strategy is probably one of the one of the fundamental pieces. From there, you can derive all the other pieces that we've seen work. For example. My preferred one is the product lifecycle or the innovation framework, because the innovation framework is uh, essentially helping everybody speak the same language in the organization, right? When we look at the startup collaboration, where we look at an internal startup, we both need to understand how mature that particular venture is. Internal or external doesn't matter. We need to speak the same language to understand, okay, how mature is the thing uh, we're talking about? Um, is it super mature because the questions for a super mature um, venture are different than the ones from early stage. And from the questions, you actually derive the actions, you derive all the other all the other things like the indicators you need to use in order to understand success and to understand progress. Everything goes back to uh, understanding the maturity of that particular thing. And you, all, you can only do that if you have a very clear uh, product lifecycle or innovation framework. So this will be my top two. And what about once you have everything up and running and moving? What happens then? Is is I, I mean I understand um, we're going to talk about governance in a minute, but before you can govern something, how how are you going to get the data about what things are going on and how do you measure the performance of innovation when you've got all this going on? Well, that's uh, that's uh, that's a topic in itself. That's a, that's a book in itself. The, <laughs> the upcoming book, innovation accounting, um, uh, measuring innovation again is very much connected to understanding the maturity of the thing you're trying to you're trying to uh, you're trying to understand. You're trying to measure. Um, how do you do it? Well, obviously, there's many ways in which you can do it. Obviously, the teams can self-report some things. Um, you need to have um, entities in place internally. Uh, we call them venture boards. Uh, essentially, uh, groups of people that uh, meet on a frequent basis, so every three weeks, every month, to discuss the ventures that they have in their portfolio, internal or external, and take go/no-go no -go decision based on the data that's being presented to them by the 
uh, by those particular ventures or the individuals responsible for, for those ventures. And that's again another another point where data is being is being collected and, and aggregated. And again, this data is being then set up the chain of command, if you want, to to the board, and they can make um, investment investment uh, decisions into strategic options, into strategic priorities. Uh, they can change the strategy. They can understand if their portfolio is growing in the direction in uh, in which they want to grow it. If they are only investing in core initiatives, where they're also branching out to transformational and uh, and adjacency, so there's uh, there's many ways where data is being collected. Um, however, what's very important is how that data is utilized and transferred from one layer to the other. What are some keys to that? I guess you've given some hints, but but is that a complicated business? Are there tools that can be used to make that more effective? Is it software? Simple there, are, there are plenty. There's, there's plenty. There's plenty of software solutions out there. However, I would not recommend anybody to go in and try to solve this problem by hiring a software solution to do it. I would say that first of all, you need to have other things in place. Try to work with pen and paper first, and by pen and paper, I also include Excel here. And once you see traction within the organization and interest towards that, and the system working, then you can you can look at either hiring a software tool to optimize the work for you, or at one point you can just create your own uh, your, your own software tool for, for measuring innovation. I have a lot of examples of clients we are working with where they decided that nothing that they can buy off the shelf would work for them and their needs, so they decided to to simply create a, um, a, a tool from, from scratch. Yeah, I've seen quite a lot of that myself, even just in the organizations I've worked with. Um, I wanted to jump to the last section of your book, which is something I found uh, entertaining, which is finally getting down to the ideas. Once you've got all these uh, these tools and processes in place and people ready to get going, uh, you can get to the idea of things. And, and it's actually interesting to me when I look at the way you describe this, it's creating, testing, scaling, and renewing. With my business, Elliott Capital, the way we look at the corporate life cycle is about uh, ideating, uh, launching, scaling up, and then renewing a business once it's reached maturity. So I really like mm -hmm. that cyclical kind of an idea in what the way you approach ideas. Can you can you tell us a little bit more about how that cycle goes in your eyes? Yeah, so that's essentially a proxy for a product life cycle, um, where you can just use it off the shelf as, uh, as your product life cycle. If you don't know where, where to start creating your, your own company's product life cycle, then you can just take that one. Um, essentially, it's just following the normal, um, let's say, development curve of a startup, right? So you start from, from an idea where you're trying to validate if there is a problem in the market. Uh, then you're looking at what kind of business model should you put on top of that problem, right? Because just identifying the problem doesn't mean you have a business. It means that you support. And then uh, you look at uh, what are the business models you can put on top. Should you put subscription on top? Should you put one-time purchase? Are we going to sell the customer data? What's what's going to happen there? Um, as as you progress the idea, then you start looking at technology. What technologies can you employ or deploy to see if uh, to see if um, that particular thing um, works with uh, with the market. So essentially, building a, a minimum viable, if you want. Although I don't want to use the, the term that way. Um, and then obviously try to expand the next step. The, lo the next logical step would be to expand beyond the uh, the beachhead geography or the beachhead um, market segment, and then uh, try to branch out in other in other geographies. Try to branch out in other segments where where just increase the number of people that you have in that segment. And then lastly, as things mature and you are you are optimizing, you can think about how do you how do you uh, change or uh, what are some add-ons you can add to the core to the core offering. So it's it's essentially the the logical, um, let's say, life cycle of a uh, of a startup, the logical path. Are there um, any steps in particular where you find companies get tripped up? Is there you know a particular pitfall, the valley of death? When it comes to this uh, idea life cycle, yeah, I would say, and um, I'm, I'm sure you agree with me. Scaling is probably the uh, the biggest uh, the biggest uh, let's say pitfall for for most organizations. Uh, twofold. On on one hand, the scaling is difficult for startups as well. Uh, for corporate innovation, even more so. Um, so. To do to do scaling right requires a lot of a lot of effort and a lot of know how, and the other thing is that I'm seeing a lot of organizations and a lot of startups as well that try to take ideas to scale prematurely, 
and again that's going to that's going to come and uh, and bite them from 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 behind very fast um, they tend to um, yeah not necessarily overestimate um, overestimate their ability to scale but uh, not necessarily understand when that point of scaling starts Yep. And I think that's going to be key. And I'm, I know that you have a lot of experience on that. And actually, if you have any tips, I'm more than uh, more than interested in uh, in learning about those. Well, I mean, I think there's no silver bullet, as you were saying. But for for many cases, I think coming back to the idea of an ecosystem, it's about figuring out how are you going to play a role within the ecosystem. It's how does this how does this entity fit into the bigger picture of things, and how is it going to interact with, with the key stakeholders to get its goal achieved. And, and to help them with their with their goals along the way, um, and actually, with that in mind, I wanted to ask you. I mean, we're in the middle of a pretty remarkable case of open innovation solving uh, the vaccine or the call for a vaccine with uh, COVID. Um, and I actually saw recent news. I don't know if you picked it up, but uh, it's Pfizer, AstraZeneca, and Amazon are going to create an innovation lab. Apparently, it'll be in Israel. Um, when it comes to whether it's physical spaces or platforms like FinTech Plus, which is about sharing ideas and fostering connections. Um, what do you think is the importance or, or how does collaborating and building these types of inno open innovation clusters fit into uh, the way you see successful corporate innovation working in a corporate startup? Yeah, it's um, obviously this, these kind of collaborations are proving now to be the way forward because essentially every organization optimizes and they have a tendency to optimize, sorry, <clears throat> They have a tendency to optimize for their comfort zone, and what I mean by comfort zone is they they tend to optimize for the things that 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 they know they are good at. Some organizations optimize for R and D. Some organizations optimize at scale. Some organizations optimize for sales or 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 or, or expansion. And uh, the thing is that the more you the more time you spend optimizing for whatever it is that you're good at, is going to obviously make you better. However, that means that you are obviously leaving uh, leaving stuff uh, that you are not good at. You are, for example, if you're good at scaling, you're probably not very good at moving things from zero to one. If you're good at expansion, you're probably find it very hard to work with a very tiny idea that just needs to be validated. Uh, but by combining forces, um, organizations that are very good at, uh, at sales and scaling, um, combining forces with somebody that's good at research and development or m essentially good at moving things from zero to one, uh, we can have uh, obviously very interesting stories to share. And I think the... Um, and the the Pfizer vaccine was a very good uh, was a very good example because Pfizer essentially was the organization that was very good at scaling stuff, uh, very good at uh, you know um, you know producing the vaccine at scale, delivering it around the world, having it shipped, having it um, you know shipped in in certain in certain conditions. However, the German company uh, was the one that was very good at R and D. Um, they could have they could have launched the the vaccine on their own for sure. However, they would have never been able to put the the vaccine in the hands of so many um, so so many countries in uh, such a short period of time. Only somebody like Pfizer could have done it. And by Pfizer, I don't mean necessarily mean only Pfizer. I'm sure that Bayer would have done it equally well. Sanofi or all the other big pharma companies, because these are these are companies that are optimized to take something to scale. But different scales of, of companies playing different roles. So you have the SMEs really diving down into the details of p figuring out every little bit of a solution or a part of the exactly. value chain. And then these larger, let's say, distribution platform or trusted banks. Uh, I look at two industries a lot outside of out of financial services. Pharma, which is one uh, you know just down the road from Zurich here in Basel. And then across the border in Germany, I think uh, you know companies like BMW and Audi when you look at the brand and the distribution that goes on top of them, it, it sort of hides the dozens and often cases hundreds or thousands of SMEs and, and uh, expert providers that really dive into the innovation and fill in the ecosystem to create these wonderful solutions. Exactly, exactly. So I don't think, I don't think there is a battle between a startup or, or, or large organizations or between startups and large organizations in general. Uh, maybe, maybe some years ago, people thought there, there, there was a battle or a war between, between, uh, between the startups and the, and the large organizations. However, I believe that now we're mature enough 
to have a mature conversations and realize that everybody's good at what they do and we can use uh, we can use the knowledge and the expertise of every party involved in order to better the lives of um, of the people of the people around us of the of the of society at large and i think the the covid situation actually showed that very well yeah hopefully we'll get this over with and we can be back to conferences and uh, regular meetings and um, get out of the home office. But until then, um, I want to uh, I want to start getting towards the, the end of this because I know you're a, a busy guy with all the innovation going on as we shift to the digital economy. Um, but Dan, um, where where do things go from here? I, I understand that there's some urgencies urgency to companies, and you would probably echo this to getting started in the corporate startup space and open innovation ecosystems. Now, um, what what sort of a message would you put behind that? Why should companies be looking at the corporate startup and picking up your book at the moment? Yeah, um, I think that, um, again, this is not something that I'm saying because I wrote the book. This is something I heard being said back to us whenever we asked for feedback for the book. I think it's a, it's a very good starting point for, for everybody and anybody that's, uh, that's interested in um, bettering their organization um, when it comes to innovation. Uh, it's a good starting point for people that want to have a roadmap on how to transform a large organization. And it's a good, uh, it's a good starting point for people that want to understand how to move things uh, within an organization, either at product, uh, product level, so as a product owner, as as a product team, how do we move stuff forward within the organization? What are the tools? What are the processes we need to have in place in order to be able to do that? But also from a governance perspective. So what are the things we need to have in place governance-wise to allow for ideas to be successful? Everybody's talking about um, you know the the uh, the moonshot projects, right? Uh, and everybody's talking about uh, moonshots and pet projects, and they are so successful. My question for large organizations, for leaders, will be, okay, so congratulations on your moonshot. Obviously, it was very successful, so big thumbs up for your effort. My question for you would be, are you able to run another moonshot next year? And my follow-up question would be, do you think the organization will be able to run a moonshot next year without you being there? And if the answer to the above two question is no, then you should probably look at the governance and you should look at changing the governments to allow for uh, for your organization to constantly la- launch uh, moonshots. I keep, I keep um, saying this in one sentence. It's nice that you have a moonshot. Do you have a space program? Very interesting way of putting it. It actually, I think... Uh, something I talk about in terms of sustainability, and I guess this would fit under uh, the G in ESG about governance and sustainability in that respect, uh, when it comes to how corporates are managed over time and how they overcome that uh, maturity phase, uh, and when it comes to actually setting up these very challenging, uh, you know, dynamic open innovation practices, you really do have to, as you say, be building for something that can that can be ongoing and effective and and I guess that's where it comes down to to really two parts. I know you uh, you have a book coming up, and hopefully we can follow up and talk more about innovation accounting next time, Dan. Uh, sure. When's that coming out? Um, hopefully we we are going to finish the digital manuscript by March, and uh, by mid next year it should be out. But uh, for the people that pre order before the end of January, they will get access to the digital manuscript the moment we finish it. That's great. Well, we'll be sure to help you promote that over the course of the next month. Um, Thank you. For those who are interested in getting uh, more of the good stuff that you're working on, uh, picking up whether it's a copy of your book, The Corporate Startup, or engaging your company out, uh, outcome, right? Outcome, yes. Um, where can where can our audience find out more or pick up uh, pick up your products and services? So the, uh, the the corporate startup book is available on Amazon around the world. So if you have an Amazon nearby, just type in the corporate startup and you'll probably find it there. I think it's also translated in like six languages or something. So if you want to read it in your in your uh, native language, you can definitely um, pick it up. Um, the innovation accounting book uh, it's the innovation account it's uh, innovationaccountingbook.com the the website where you can go in and pre order. Uh, I think pre orders will end. Uh, before the end of January, so around the 20th of January, when we're going to reorder. Um, and for our company, you can just go to weareoutcome.co. That's where you can find uh, myself and my group, and you can see all the good things that we've done, or hopefully good things that we've done. <laughs> well, I'm a big fan, Dan, so thank you for, for coming and joining me today. And of course, if anybody wants to reach out to us and, and 
uh, find out more about Dan, I'm happy to to share more insights. Um, any last messages, Dan, before we say goodbye? No, I wish everybody a, a good start of the year. And um, hopefully innovation is going to help us uh, go through everything. Great. Yeah, I echo that entirely from over here in Zurich. And I hope you're enjoying your holidays over in South Germany. Um, so until next week, when we come back with another interview, I thank everybody for tuning in. And uh, thank you, Dan, for joining us uh, virtually today. Thank you very much for having me. Great. All the best.